Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here at Covenant United Methodist Church in Rochester, New York, as we have been saying uh, the last few weeks on the Reading on the Rock. Um, and so we welcome you into this time of worship uh, on this beautiful day. It might be a little cold outside, and we're just hoping this is our last little bit of snow. Um, and so we gather together this morning. Uh, we've got a few announcements, but the the tone of the worship service, this is our second Sunday of Lent that I'm going to um, talk about in a minute. Um, and it's as though we're on this pilgrimage. We're on a journey with Christ um, toward Jerusalem. And so as we look at what that means for us as individuals, what it means for us as a church, we'll look at that in the, in the sermon um, coming up. Our announcements this morning, uh, we do have um, some announcements. There they are. <laughs> reading on the Rock. Uh, we kicked off our Reading on the Rock for Lent uh, this last Monday, and uh, Bob has done a phenomenal job um, doing an intro and then a story and an activity and then tying it up with a kind of a book end to its um, presentation. So it's, it's great. and. Um, it's fun, uh, so if you're curious yourself, I think you'd enjoy the story coming up this week. And also, uh, if you know of anyone that uh, has children that might also enjoy it. So uh, it gets posted at seven o'clock on Mondays, but you can go into Facebook or YouTube and uh, watch it there uh, at any time. Monday uh, at the coven our covenant table, um, Ricardo came up to us and asked if um, we had any furniture or housewares. They had been burned out of an apartment and had nothing. And uh, Red Cross is putting them up at an apartment on East Main Street. And so he was asking if we had any furniture. Um, he asked specifically for a microwave, uh, clothes, bedding, anything like this that they might um, we be able to use. If you have anything, let me know. We don't have, they don't even have a phone. So we will be um, contacting them when they come tomorrow night for dinner and also we have their address. And so as we begin our worship this morning, we begin with the prelude, Lord enthroned in heavenly splendor.
Um, is there an opening prayer? Oh, no opening prayer? Well, then I guess well, we, we do this. Are, <laughs> no. We will pray. God of gracious presence who swirls among us as we speak, bless us and keep us as we open our minds and open our hearts to the understanding and the reading of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to get this right yet. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I invite you to stand as we gather into God's presence together in song. be seated for the reading of the psalm. This is Psalm 27, verses 1 through 3 and 11 through 14. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? Mm -hmm. The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. Mm -hmm. Teach me how to live, O Lord. Lead me along the right path, for my enemies are waiting for me. Do not let me fall into their hands, for they accuse me of things I've never done. With every breath they threaten me with violence. Yes, I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Mm -hmm. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Amen. And please stand for the reading of the gospel. 
Luke 13, verses 31 through 35. All that time, some Pharisees said to Jesus, Get away from here if you want to live. Herod Antipas wants to kill you. Jesus replied, Go tell that fox that I will keep on casting out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And the third day, I will accomplish my purpose. Yes, today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must proceed on my way. For it wouldn't do for a prophet of God to be killed except in Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now, look, your house is abandoned. And you will never see me again until you say, Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Please pray with me. Holy God, hear our prayer of lament and our prayer of hope. Meet us where we are this day that you may gather us in under your wing. Amen. So as I said earlier, this is our second Sunday in Lent. We are continuing on our pilgrimage to Good Friday and Easter. And we do so in a spirit of prayer, in a spirit of trust with God, and a vision of hope for the future. Faith in Jesus, trust in God, hope for a future kingdom, as Margaret would say. It's a place where God's children, or kin, will know peace. That is Jesus' way, and that makes it our way. But these things don't happen in a vacuum. Faith, trust, hope, those are grounded in Jesus. And the way that we come to know Jesus' way is only by traveling with him. To take this season of Lent seriously and to be brutally honest with ourselves about our commitment to the journey. Today, Jesus continues on his way to Jerusalem, and it is a journey fraught with danger, challenges, temptations. Time after time, Luke says, there are opportunities for Jesus to abandon the journey, to proclaim, you know what, it's just too hard or even to just give up. But today demonstrates that Jesus is resolute. He is determined. He's faithful. And he's trusting. And on this journey, there is no room for lies or deception. And the only way to walk with Jesus on this pilgrimage is if we do so with integrity and an open willingness to repent and redirect, change our ways. And so as we continue on this pilgrimage this, with this reading in Luke, it's about Jesus' encounter with kindly Pharisees. And it's not very often in uh, the Gospels, that the Pharisees are portrayed as being kind. But they warned Jesus how Herod Antipas was planning to kill him. They warned Jesus to run away, get out of here, because you are in danger. 
And Jesus' reply is with conviction. And then almost simultaneously goes into a lament. And every time I read this story, I am struck by this mood change of Jesus, going from a defiant reply to the Pharisees to a tender lament over the children who disregard the blessings of the Lord. So Jesus begins with sending a very strong message to Herod. And he name calls him. He calls him a fox. And basically says, I'm not going anywhere except to Jerusalem. I've made a promise. And a promise made is a promise kept. Now what I learned about that name calling, the word fox, in those days, it didn't mean an animal or um, that cunning or crafty. It wasn't comparing Herod to being cunning or crafty. It was a word of contempt. I can think of a few in our language today, but I can't say them in worship. <laughs> and so Jesus was talking um, and referring to Herod with disdain. And then comes the lament. You can almost hear the sadness in his voice. And Jesus' lament is over the city on the hill that symbolically represents the children of God. And this lament is directed toward those who opt to abandon the journey to proclaim it's just too hard or just give up. And that makes Jesus very sad. It's a lament of tenderness and sorrow. Jesus refers um, to Jerusalem um, as a city who kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, labeling it as a threatening place of fear and distrust. And yet through it all, Jesus says God has yearned to gather the children together, to shelter them like a mother hen shelters her chicks under her wings. That's not a vengeful God. It's not a God of anger. I read into those words a God who longed for the children to be trusting and patient and to seek out the ways of healing and restoration. Jesus' entire ministry from baptism to the cross is rooted in repentance and forgiveness. And that offer extends to everyone. Even Herod Antipas and the lost children of Jerusalem. Angela Reed says, Jesus' commitment to vanquish evil and bring restoration against all odds teaches us something about the character of God. And I agree. Jesus teaches us that God is a God of unending patience whose grace is always there to lovingly bring us into God's sheltering presence. And nothing, absolutely nothing, separates God from those who open their hearts to the love of Jesus. Marty Hagen, who wrote the song Gather Us In, puts it this way. Gather us in the rich and the haughty. Gather us in the proud and the strong. Give us a heart so meek and so lowly. 
Give us the courage to enter the song. For God, there is always room for repentant Herods in this world. But for right now, Jesus is more than a little annoyed by Herod's threats. Because Jesus knows what is to come, and nothing is going to stop him. Just like nothing should stop us from the pilgrimage that we are on. Jesus tells the Pharisees to tell Herod, I will keep on doing what I'm doing. And I'm going to do it today and tomorrow and the next. So get out of my way. There's conviction in that statement. As if nothing was going to get in the way of Good Friday and Easter. Tammy read Psalm 27 first, and I want her to read it again. I, I've got it on paper, um, because I want you to now listen with gospel ears. So Psalm 27, verses 1 to 3 and 11 to 14. Sorry, I didn't warn you about that. <laughs> it's right there. on paper, so I have to take my glasses off. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, mm -hmm. so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. Teach me how to live, O Lord. Lead me along the right path. For my enemies are waiting for me. Mm -hmm. Do not let me fall into their hands, for they accuse me of things that I have never done. With every breath, they threaten me with violence. Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Mm -hmm. Could you hear Jesus? I heard Jesus' challenge to Herod Antipas. And I heard his lament for Jerusalem as though Jesus redefined Psalm 27. God shelters us from our enemies. Jesus teaches us God's ways. And we are to wait patiently, be brave and courageous. And so this idea of waiting for God, it's embedded in the Psalms of Lament. Waiting implies something is yet to come. Waiting expresses this kind of straining forward into the future. There was this keen, keen anticipation and hope of what is to come. And hope is waiting for that with one's entire being for the coming of the dawn, the light. And that is where this restoring word of God's forgiveness is spoken. And so if you read the entire Psalm 27, you're also going to hear echoes of Psalm 23, which we're very familiar with. It's a song of reassurance and comfort, even in the midst of threats and unease. Hmm something we are very much in need of today. Now last week we marked the two-year anniversary of living in the midst of this pandemic. And we've learned a lot in two years. 
And hopefully, one of the greatest things that we have learned is how to trust in Jesus and his resolute conviction, his reassurance, and sheltering presence. And it hasn't been easy. I know I wanted to get off the pandemic bus a time or two. Every week, we have prayed for people with COVID. And we have prayed for families and friends of loved ones who's lost them in this disease. We have also embraced new ministries of feeding the hungry, making sure that there was room in our building for addiction recovery, and adding times of reflection and prayer throughout the week. And then just as we thought that we may be experiencing the waning of COVID, a war begins in Ukraine. We don't have a lot of bandwidth left. It seems like there is no break in the turmoil. Are we tempted to just say, I'm done, I quit, forget this? But what I hear more often is, how can I help? What can we do? So the first thing that came to mind is that we don't complain about the price of gas. <laughs> we give financial gifts to UMCOR, which is the United Methodist Committee on Relief, who are already working on supporting refugees throughout Europe and abroad. We can pray for the people of Ukraine. We can even pray for the Herod Antipas of our day to awaken to the power of God's army surrounding his. But for now, we imagine how every week Jesus gathers us in as a mother hen sheltering her chicks under her wings. We read and we listen to his teachings. And we try our best to follow him along that pilgrimage to Good Friday in Easter. And probably the hardest things that we thing that we have had to do in the last two years is to stay optimistic which is why my favorite line in Psalm 27 is, yet, and that's an important word, yet, I am confident. I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Not the Lord's goodness after we die, but the goodness that we find all around us in the helpers and the doers, the prayers, the givers. The Lord's goodness is everywhere. Even in the midst of pandemic and fears of war. And if nothing else in these times of great angst and unsettledness, fear and even anger, God's goodness overwhelms us. And our prayer should always be that as witnesses and doers of that goodness, it's just part and parcel of the pilgrimage. It's part of the journey. And we go forth step by step. Jesus is here today and tomorrow and the next day. And one day we believe with heart, mind, and soul that Jesus will come again. And so our task is to wait patiently, trust in God, 
Rest in the assurance of God's love. Be brave and courageous. And pray for a future with hope. Now, if we were to go back and reread the gospel lesson of today, which we won't do, um, I wonder how the meaning would change if we substituted our own names for the word Jerusalem. And it's an act of humility when we can place ourselves in that lament as a student, a learner of the one who leads us all down the road toward Jerusalem. Oh, Anne. Anne, the one who ignores the prophets and disregards God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather you in as a hen shelters her chicks beneath her wings. But you ignored me. And now, look, you feel adrift and alone. But I am with you always and wait patiently for you to say, Blessings to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It's powerful, it's humbling, and it's convicting. So let us pray for the blessings of the one who comes in the name of the Lord as Chris sings Psalm 27.
One of the beautiful things of being in the temple mm -hmm. of the Lord is God's presence yeah. wherever we are. And so even although our music behind our prayer says we have to walk this load by ourselves, mm -hmm. we don't. Right. right. Yeah, we it's not wise. We don't. <laughs> We continue to pray for um, Anne recovering from hip surgery, mm -hmm. for Paul, Frank's brother, and for Sandy and Gloria. We have also been asked this week um, three different prayer requests for mental health. Yes. Mm -hmm. Libby, mm -hmm. a teenager, mm -hmm. Tim, and Evan. We also pray for Ricardo and Nicole, who has, have lost everything in that fire. And for Bashir and Janice mm -hmm. this week. Janice has had a very, very tiring week. Mm -hmm. um, and any mother knows what that feels like. <laughs> so let us be in a spirit of prayer to the God of promise and mm -hmm. presence. Mm -hmm. of promise and presence, here we are again, gathered in to seek a sense of your power in our weakness, your rest for our weariness, your challenge for our complacency. Like Jesus, we sometimes feel like we are alone dealing with all our stuff by ourselves. Forgive us for forgetting, forgetting you hurt with us, forgetting you call us into the suffering world, not out of it, and forgetting that you do not leave us to cope all by ourselves. Thank you for the gift of community for the privilege of holding each other in prayer and in person. Thank you for the gift of friends and strangers who offer us signs of your strength and help us to remember all we so easily forget of your presence and your promise. Ever-present God, help us be open enough to feel your comfort and healing in ourselves and in those we have named aloud, and for those we now speak in the silent depths of our hearts. Hospitable God, help us be welcoming to the stranger whether they be homeless or refugees. Help us to be generous and prayerful when we cannot be there in person. Help us realize we have not been as generous or prayerful about other places of warfare where victims don't look like us. Strengthening God, help us be courageous when called to confront wrong and speak out for peace in our homes, on our streets, across the world. Help us speak out for justice and equity in our own relationships and in our communities. God of the covenant, you have been faithful when we have not. Help us remember, not forget. Help us remember we are not alone. 
Remember that the suffering of the world unites us in deeper ways with you, who takes on the suffering of the world and ours. Thank you above all for Jesus, our example in life and death, as well as our example in prayer, as we join hearts and voices in calling you the God of the universes. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. When I said in the sermon that we have adopted a ministry of um, feeding people, it's very um, humbling. Thank you, John. Um, during the week, when I see people that I know and people that I don't know filling the blessing box. So it has just been a very um, rewarding thing to watch that activity happen, you know, with no effort on my part whatsoever. Um, so it's always good. We do have uh, several ways uh, for you to provide those financial gifts, either to the church or to UMCOR. You can, uh, if, if you give online through our Vanco services, just make sure you memo um, UMCOR. If you put it into what we call operations, we will redirect that. UMCOR has um, um, the type of structure that when you give $10 or $100 to UMCOR, 100% of it goes to where you tell them, ask them to, to send it. And we, uh, so there's the website giving portal, there's also the offering plate in the back or um, through your bank, um, through a check on, um, through the mail. But let us pray a blessing upon the gifts given this week. God of everlasting presence in our lives, we thank you for the gifts that you have already given us in Jesus and through the Holy Spirit that every day we can find your goodness somewhere. And so we give back and we dedicate these gifts to you, that we use them in ways that brings about your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Step by step, we take out on this pilgrimage toward Good Friday and the cross. So I invite you to rise as we sing step by step. forth from this place remember 
It's just a step by step in following Jesus. Don't be overwhelmed. Don't be mm-hmm. discouraged that we go forth by faith, step by step. Please be seated for our prelude, our postlude called Shelter. the people of God say, Amen. Amen.